so hello everyone welcome back to bajira ys academy previous year questions analysis so today is 12th november 2023 so as part of this lecture we will be try and understand few questions like uh, indian regional navigation system and its potential applications and cyber security how technology plays a crucial role in cyber security and we will also understand how india has emerged as a leader in digital transactions now india is leading the world in number of digital transactions so we will also try and understand what is geospatial technology and what are its potential applications so all these questions are part of general studies paper 3 both science and technology and indian economy section now the first question that we are going to discuss is about indian regional navigation satellite system okay so this is also known as navic system now this is india's own navigation satellite system so earlier we used to depend on gps global positioning system for our navigation needs however ever since we have our own navigation satellite system through indian regional navigation satellite system this is a constellation of seven satellites in both geosynchronous orbit and also the geo uh, Uh, earth orbit okay so uh, in this context we need to discuss the role of indian regional navigation satellite system that is navic program on the satellite navigation system in india so this is the question and in introduction itself you just write what is indian regional navigation satellite system so what is irnss navic and then you need to discuss the role of irnss navic program on the satellite navigation system firstly understand this irnss is actually designed for accurate real time positioning and timing services so through irnss we can get the accurate and real time positioning and timing services so this is particularly for users in india and it uh, the irnss extends up to the 1500 kilometers okay from the boundary or from the territory of india to 1500 kilometers so this is its geographical or territorial expanse so if you carefully look at the indian regional navigation satellite system it consists of seven satellites total of seven satellites okay so this is the constellation of irnss now among the seven satellite three satellites are in geostationary earth orbit okay so they are in the geostationary earth orbit and four satellites are in geosynchronous orbit okay so they are also inclined to 29 degrees to equator now uh, understand in each of these satellites there are three rubidium atomic clocks so what is the application of these rubidium atomic clocks so they provide accurate locational data so in order to have uh, accuracy over the location okay so uh, irnss is all about navigation and positioning and accurate location services so therefore three rubidium atomic clocks which provide accurate locational data so uh what type of a services are provided by the irnss it provides two types of services so firstly first uh, sort of a service it provides is standard positioning service it is meant for all users so all users stands to benefit from the standard positioning services that are provided by the irnss navic secondly restricted services so restricted services means services which are specially provided for the military and security agencies so they are not available for the civilians so they are generally encrypted services okay so they are provided only for the military and security agencies and they are not available for the civilian usage now given here there are some applications of the irnss navic system so what are those applications so the applications include the terrestrial aerial and marine navigation so all sorts of navigation 
will get benefit from the IRNSS. So apart from that, disaster management is also a potential application. Okay, so now a country like India with a such a vast, uh, you know, territorial expanse, and it is also vulnerable to a wide variety of disasters. So the satellite, uh, the IRNSS navigation system will also help India tackle or deal with disaster management. So apart from that, vehicle tracking, fleet management, and precise timing mapping, and geo data terrestrial navigation aid for hikers travelers and visual voice navigation for the drivers so these are all the services which are being provided by the constellation of navic so after that uh, you know while earlier we used to depend on uh, gps that is global positioning system for our navigation requirements now we have developed our own navigation satellite system so american satellite consists of 24 satellites in orbit okay so the number of sort satellites visible to ground receivers is actually limited when it uh, when it when we talk about the american gps so however when we talk about the indian regional navigation satellite system so it has four satellites okay so they are always in geosynchronous orbits okay so there are two orbits one is geostationary orbit and another is geosynchronous orbit so right so in geosynchronous orbit so uh, you know uh, in geostationary they appear that always are fixed in a permanent location okay so uh, geosynchronous orbit we can track them from the earth so hence always visible in receiver in a region of 1500 kilometer around earth so this is all about the indian regional navigation satellite system next so uh, irnss is actually so what exactly is irnss now so uh, at first you need to write a brief introduction about irnss so what exactly is indian regional navigation satellite system so this is an independent regional navigation satellite system so why independent because it is developed by india on its own so earlier we used to depend on gps now we have our own independent and indigenous NAS regional navigation satellite system and it is developed by it is developed and designed by india okay so it provides the accurate position information services to various users across india okay so uh, what is the territorial expanse of uh, the irnss the territorial expanse is 1500 kilometers from the boundary india's boundary to 1500 kilometers up to it can provide accurate locational and positional services so so it can be considered as its primary service area okay so this is considered as its primary uh, service area the 1500 kilometers up to 1500 kilometers now in this context try and understand the significance of the indian regional navigation satellite system that is navic Okay, what is the significance of IRNSS NAVIC? So it gives real-time information for two services. So earlier also we have understood what are those two services. One is the standard positioning service. Okay, so standard positioning services are available for the civilian users. So <clears throat> civilians can use this standard positioning services. So on the other hand, we should also discuss about the restricted services which may be encrypted for authorized users like military and security agencies okay so uh, this provides a uh, two types of services standard positioning service and restricted services so however if you look at uh, the whole world what are the countries which have their own independent regional navigation satellite system so there are only five countries they have their own navigation systems so firstly usa okay so usa has gps gps is their own navigation system so glonass uh, of russia galileo of europe and baidu of china so after these four countries india is the only country that have its own independent regional navigation uh, a satellite system okay so this is uh, uh, the significance of indian regional navigation satellite system or navic now after that we need to understand the potential uses of irnss 
what are the potential uses and benefits so uh, the applications include terrestrial aerial and marine navigation so as i have already uh, discussed uh, with you uh, about the potential applications or the potential uses so uh, terrestrial aerial and marine navigation also the navic will be useful disaster management and we can track the vehicles and we can also manage the fleet especially with respect to mining and transportation sector we can manage the fleet so after that integration with the mobile phones so the uh, similar to gps irnss can also be integrated with the mobile phones and precise timing for uh, atms power grids so it is very important for the, in order to achieve the precise timing and precise location so uh, each satellite have three rubidium atomic clocks so after that mapping and genocide data capture is also possible by this uh, uh, you know irnss satellites so after that uh, these are the potential applications of irnss and uh, we have discussed this question so the next question uh, is about uh, uh, cyber security okay so technology transformation and breakthroughs are poised to bring a uh, entirely new paradigm in new paradigm for cyber security so in the light of this statement elaborate on the role of uh, you know uh, technology in cyber security so we need to elaborate the role of technology in cyber security okay so uh, cyber security is one of the most crucial uh, uh, thing uh, in a modern day because of uh, you know uh, increasing rapidly increasing or uh, expanding technology uh, bringing new advancements so new advancements have also resulted in uh, increasing cyber threats increasing challenges to the cyber security in fact the personal financial information or individual information uh, uh, you know is being uh, threatened by these uh, cyber threats so in fact there were reports that aadhaar data is leaked it is in dark web so a uh, leak of aadhaar data or uh, personal information in a public domain is a very challenging thing so in this context technology transformation and breakthrough are poised a poised to bring entirely a new paradigm for cyber security so there is no doubt about that so technology transformation brings a you know a breakthrough a new paradigm in cyber security now in this context we need to understand uh, the role of technology firstly you have to write so what exactly is cyber security so cyber security is information technology okay so this is an information technology security so uh, there are techniques for protecting computers networks programs and data so uh, cyber security protects uh, all the personal data networks and even programs from the unauthorized access or unauthorized use from a third party or the second party okay so it prevents the unauthorized access or attacks that aimed for the exploitation of cyber physical systems and critical information infrastructure now in this context we need to understand what exactly the cyber physical systems and critical information infrastructure now cyber physical systems they actually uh, you know integrating devices okay so they are integrating mechanisms so they integrate sensing computation control and networking into different physical objects okay so different physical or physical objects and infrastructure so therefore connecting them to the internet and to the each other so this is the meaning of cyber physical systems so after that the second uh, important aspect in cyber security is protecting critical information infrastructure so what exactly the critical information infrastructure now the it act information technology act 2000 so although we do not have any dedicated legislation in order to tackle the cyber security threats but we have a legislation so that deals with the cyber security incidents okay so cyber uh, cyber threats and cyber security so we have it act 2000 okay so this it act 2000 defines the critical information infrastructure so it defines uh, you, critical information infrastructure as a computer resource the incapacitation or destruction 
of which shall have a deliberating impact on the national security, economy, public health and safety. So for example, in simple terms, so if any computer resource or any device that is being attacked or that is being hacked by a third party, so will have a, a very serious implications for national security and whole economy, public health and safety. So therefore, this is defined as a critical information infrastructure. Protection of critical information infrastructure is very important for us. For example, there were attacks on nuclear power plants, attacks on uh, power grids in Maharashtra, Mumbai. So therefore, it is a very important and a very critical to protect our critical information infrastructure. Right? Now, after that, how technology enhance cybersecurity? So we should not forget the role of technology in enhancing the cyber security. Okay. So, uh, you know, as I have, uh, as we have already discussed that technology has been uh, advancing at a rapid pace. So along with the advancing technology, it has also enabled some threats. So it has also resulted in some threats. Okay. So what are the threats? In recent times, there were, uh, you know, uh, uh, unauthorized access uh, into computers, uh, threatening our personal, uh, you know, I, uh, privacy, and even uh, our financial information is in the hands of these potential hackers, and they also, uh, you know, uh, accessing the public information, uh, you know, from uh, you know recently the Ada data was leaked from the ICMR data. So therefore, they have the unauthorized access of information from these, uh, you know, uh, agencies. So with the evolving technology, with the advancements in technology, new threats are also being emerged. So therefore, technology can be used to thwart those threats. Okay, so technology can be used as an effective means to tackle these challenges and also develop a more robust security so uh, technology is uh, you know uh, it can be called as a double edged sword okay so on the uh, one hand so we can use uh, on the one hand technology has uh, creating threats to our cyber security but on the other hand we can use the technology uh, to tackle these challenges and develop a more robust security architecture so how technology can effectively strengthen cyber security so what is the role of cybersecurity uh, in strengthening, uh, you know, what is the role of technology in strengthening cybersecurity? First and foremost, blockchain technology can be used to tackle the threats of cybersecurity because, uh, you know, now the amount of data uh, uh, that is being stored in the cloud. Okay. So cloud is, uh, you know, uh, it is available for the store. St uh, we can store data in cloud. And in fact, so online reaches are uh, unbelievable. Now, a huge amounts of data can be stored in cloud. And uh, so in this uh, in this particular context, blockchain has emerged as a one of the way for companies to secure their data. Now, companies have been increasingly resorting to the blockchain technology in order to, uh, uh, you know, in order to safeguard or secure the data because a uh, huge amounts of data is being stored in clouds so therefore it is imperative to save the data or secure the data so blockchain technology have a potential applications with respect to the secure uh, with respect to securing the personal data so now data is uh, encrypted on a decentralized ledger in blockchain so encrypted data is not easy to access by any other party by a third party so therefore it requires a strict validation process uh, whenever someone accessing this information so therefore blockchain technology is a potential uh, game changer when it comes to uh, safeguarding and securing the data of the companies because huge data is being generated by uh, you know uh, nowadays uh, different companies when the government has been uh, generating huge data so blockchain technology can safeguard this data so uh, in order to say uh, secure the data uh, 
the users need to use the combination of public and private keys so in order to unlock and access data so accessing data is not easy so in order to access the data the users have to use a combination of public and private keys only then they can unlock and access the data so apart from that there are also big data analytics so big data analytics also have the uh, potential applications with respect to changing the cyber security or uh, you know strengthening cyber security so the same big data analytics uh, engines can sift data and use trend analysis to determine company cyber resilience so you know cyber resilience is very crucial to understand whether a company has a robust uh, a cyber security mechanism in place for example if someone try uh, to access the information which is already stored the cyber resilience mechanism of that particular company uh, you know uh, help us understand whether uh, uh, the information is under threat or uh, it can be easily accessible by a third party or it cannot be accessible by by a third party and that is the essence of securing data so therefore the big data analytics will help us understand the cyber resilience of a company okay so uh, you know if cyber resilience of a company is weak then uh, the appropriate interventions can be made in terms of developing uh, you know uh, 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 appropriate interventions improvements and also developing new security protocols so this way our uh, technology also helping strengthen cyber security so we have discussed about blockchain technology and also big data analytics and the third major uh, technology that can be used to safeguard or secure uh, data is artificial intelligence so artificial intelligence is considered as a step beyond the big data analytics so uh, by using big data we are just understanding the resilience so okay data resilience of a company so through artificial intelligence is is actually a step uh, a big step uh, okay a step beyond the big data analytics so using artificial intelligence systems can be trained to identify and mitigate threats so if we have any threats to the cyber security so those uh, those threats can be identified and can be mitigated successfully the system identifies behavior and tendencies of the hackers with what data they go after so the artificial intelligence will identify the behavior and also the tendencies of the hackers what information they are actually targeting and what information so they have been focusing on so that is what the essence of the artificial intelligence in strengthening in further strengthening the artificial intelligence now in this context what are the challenges that are being related to cyber security in india okay so uh, it is also important to identify the challenges the existing challenges so that when we identify those challenges appropriate interventions and appropriate safety protocols can be made so firstly profit friendly infrastructure mindset so that is very crucial profit friendly infrastructure mindset so <clears throat> see nowadays uh, after especially after the lpg reforms liberalization globalization and privatization reforms what happened was private companies have been focusing on maximizing profits okay so rather than maximizing the security uh, architecture or the security infrastructure they have now focusing on maximizing profits so as part of this plan they have developed profit friendly infrastructure mindset or profit friendly infrastructure so a profit friendly infrastructure often compromises with the cyber threats or cyber security so therefore it is the first and foremost challenge so since they have focusing on profit friendly infrastructure they have low cyber security preparedness inadequate cyber security preparedness and recovery in regulatory frameworks is actually a cause of concern so therefore they have to 
increase their infrastructure enhance their infrastructure that could be able to deal with the potential cyber security threats the next major challenge is absence of separate procedural code okay so there is no separate procedural code for the investigation of these cyber attacks cyber threats so that is the next major challenge so after that the transnational nature of the cyber attacks is also another major challenge now these cyber attacks have not been emerging from one particular country i mean uh, you know so uh, since because of globalization everything is interconnected so technology has no boundaries it respects no boundaries so therefore you know uh, hackers sitting in one part of the world have been attacking uh, uh, people uh, attacking systems in the other part of the world so therefore cyber crimes can be categorized as transnational in nature so they are categorized as a transnational crimes so because of this collection of evidence from the foreign territories is not easy because uh, foreign jurisdictions have their own uh, laws so with respect to uh, you know uh, uh, investigation so therefore collection of evidence from those foreign territories is not easy because of uh, the advancements in technology it is also not easy to find out those uh, threats those hackers who have been having illegal access to our own systems so therefore it is a very difficult and tardy process because of the transnational nature of the crimes so this is the third major challenge so after that so we should also discuss about expanding digital ecosystem because of the advancements in technology in last few years we have seen a rapid and robust increase uh, expanding of digital ecosystem particularly in india now the digital divide is being minimized further it has been narrowed down further now everyone have access to the digital ecosystem so therefore in this respect india has traversed on the path of digitalizing its various economic factors now digital transactions digital banking okay so everything is being done digitally so particularly uh, you know in last 10 years so therefore because of increased digital transformation so it has also resulted in increased uh, cyber security threats okay so uh, it has carved a niche for itself successfully now after that we also have a limited expertise and authority we do not have a huge expertise skilled manpower so they can identify and detect these cyber security threats so this is also a major problem so uh, understand uh, you know cryptocurrency boom has taken place in last 10 years okay so cryptocurrency has become has emerged as a major currency system so it is very often under reported the cryptocurrency system is very often either not reported or under reported so therefore you know uh, the crimes which involve uh, cryptocurrency is not very easy because they are not strictly regulated and they are also under reported or not reported so these are the challenges with respect to the cyber security now we have also understood how technology will help solve the uh, will help strengthen cyber security so we have discussed about big data artificial intelligence and also the other uh, technological innovations okay so blockchain technology as well so they have a uh, significant implications or applications with respect to cyber security now when you write the conclusion so given the future of technology under industrial revolution 4.0 now industrial revolution 4.0 has been taking place so transformation of our economies and uh, transformation of technology reflects industrial revolution 4.0 so uh, on the eve of ir 4.0 india requires a strong cyber security framework and that is based on 4d principles so what are these four different things they are data detect destroy and document so these are known as 4d principles so that it can sub subverse all attempts towards any cyber challenges so we can deal with any cyber security challenges if we follow the 4d principles in letter and spirit so what are these 4d principles data detect destroy and document so this is the mantra for tackling the cyber security challenges 
So the next question uh, is about the geospatial technology. So what is the geospatial technology? Now geospatial technology has a very important or crucial applications, right? So uh, geospatial technology is now considered as an asset by any government. Now in this context, we need to discuss significance and potential applications of the geospatial technology and also the challenges in effective use of the geospatial technologies. So this question has, you know, four parts. So firstly, we need to understand the geospatial technology. So you just write what is geospatial technology in the introduction and then write significance and applications of the geospatial technology. And after that, you just write the challenges in the effective use of geospatial technology. And when you write conclusion for this answer, you just write the solutions or suggestions. And that is how you can write a holistic answer for this question. First, understand what is geospatial technology. So this geospatial technology facilitates the process of capture, storing, processing, displaying, and disseminating information tied to a location. So imagine there's a particular location. So in this particular location, uh, we need to capture the location details and store, process, display, dissemination, all the details about a particular location is called as a geospatial technology. Now geospatial technology has several applications with respect to economy, research and tourism. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, uh, documentation, store, retrieval and displaying, dissemination of information is very important. So uh, it has a potential application. So uh, what are the applications which are uh, being, uh, uh, which are under the geospatial technology that can be derived from the geospatial technology. So for example, we can understand climate change and disaster management. If we have a comprehensive picture over a particular location, for example, when it comes to landslides, the geospatial technology will help understand the vulnerability of a particular area so that can give us advanced warnings so when we have advanced warnings we can disseminate information at an early stage so we can warn the people so thereby we can reduce or minimize loss of lives and losses to the property and infrastructure secondly earth observation is another major application of the geospatial technology so the earth observation uh, capabilities like water quality underground water quality, water quality on ponds, lakes, and even vegetation, forest cover, forest fires. So all these threats and resources can be effectively observed through the geospatial technologies. So after that, we can also monitor the, uh, you know, contact tracing. So during COVID-19 pandemic, geospatial technology has helped us monitor the contact tracing. Now, if we do not uh, able to trace the contacts using geospatial technology, the spread of COVID-19 pandemic would have been much worse. So th that would have a, a huge consequences on uh, health of people. So after that, these societal problems can also be solved by the geospatial technology. For example, uh, when it comes to education, livelihood opportunities and financial inclusion. Now, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Okay, so the Manrega, uh, you know, scheme assets, the assets which are created by the Manrega are geotagged. Geospatial technology is being used to assess the work which is being done by the Manrega workers. So therefore, duplication of work can be minimized through geospatial technology. This is also another major application. So after that, we can also track the goods. Okay, for example, goods are being transported from one part of uh, one region to the other region. For example, public distribution system food grains are being transported. So we can track the logistics, we can track the goods through geospatial technology and even real estate also have a potential applications with respect to the geospatial technology. For example, analyzing the real estate objects remotely. So these are all the applications of the geospatial technology. Now, what are the technologies that are being used in uh, used as part of the geospatial technology? 
so one is remote sensing so this is the te uh, technology that is being used so you very often come across the remote sensing when it comes to uh, you know uh, observing resources the remote sensing satellites so through remote sensing satellites we can understand the crop losses so in case of uh, any disaster so we can also predict the disasters and we can disseminate early warnings through remote sensing so through remote sensing we can assess the forest cover the loss of mangroves in sundarbans in other coastal areas okay so we can un also understand the rise of sea levels in the coastal areas using remote sensing so therefore remote sensing has a, a lot of potential applications so so it could be used for monitoring the physical characteristics of a particular area through either through satellite or aircraft so secondly the global positioning system is also part of the geospatial system so this is a satellite navigation system so gps is owned by usa so therefore this is also a navigation system that is used to determine the ground positioning of an object the location and the positioning of an object can be determined by the gps so after that the geographic information system gis so this is also part of the geospatial technology so this is a computer system for capturing storing and displaying of data related to the positions on earth surface so we can capture store and display the information using the geospatial information technology or geographical information system so 3d modeling is another uh, technology aspect under geo technology so it can be used for creating a three dimensional representation of an object or a surface so these are the technologies which are part of geospatial technology and these are the potential applications now the government has also uh, recently notified national policy on geospatial technology okay so uh, in this context what are the basic provisions under the national policy on geospatial technology so what are the goals which are set by the government so the goals of national uh, geospatial technology policy is that develop a geospatial technology geospatial knowledge infrastructure okay so the government is aimed at developing a geospatial knowledge infrastructure so this is being underpinned by integrated data and information framework so however by 2030 we need to pursue a set of goals with respect to national policy of geospatial technology so they include high resolution topographical survey mapping and also uh, you know so what are the basic aspects in the high resolution topographical survey mapping so 5 to 10 centimeters for urban rural areas and 50 to 100 centimeters for forest and wastelands okay so this is part of the national policy on geospatial technology so so in this context the second goal that has to be achieved by 2030 is high accuracy digital elevation model okay so this is deployed for entire country okay so this is being used for uh, you know uh, understanding and also uh, uh, the locational factors for example the plain hilly and mountainous areas okay so observing these locational factors now after that we should also enhance the capabilities skilled manpower and also awareness to meet the future needs of the country so these are the goals that were set uh, by the national policy on geospatial technology by 2030 so we also have a set of goals that has to be that have to be achieved by 2035 so they include high resolution accuracy bathymetric geospatial data of inland waters and sea surface topography of shallow deep seas so that particularly used for blue economy okay so secondly survey and mapping of subsurface infrastructure in major cities and towns so this is the second major objective and third national digital twin of major cities and towns so these are the basic provisions of national policy on geospatial technology now after that we have to dis understand the challenges so what are the challenges to the geospatial technologies implementation 
so that is being also asked in the question so there is no demand for geospatial services as of now geospatial services have no demand in fact the products on a scale linked to india's potential and size so considering keeping in mind india's potential and size there is no demand for geospatial services this is the first challenge the second challenge is uh, there is no demand mainly due to lack of awareness among the potential users so uh, the potential users have no idea no awareness about these services these geospatial technology services that is a major hurdle thirdly the other major hurdle is lack of skilled manpower so this is one of the major challenge whenever we are uh, we are talking about uh, industrial revolution 4.0 or any other major technology lack of skilled manpower is a major challenge in fact if you look at the entire country around 4.65 percentage of total population a total workforce which is being skilled so uh, you know if you compare this number with the uh, japan that has, that has around 85 percentage of the skilled manpower and if you compare it with the south korea that has 96 percentage of the total skilled manpower so therefore lack of skilled manpower is a major challenge so after that there is also a lack of availability of the foundation data so foundation data with respect to high resolution so high resolution uh, mapping of a different locations so that is also a major challenge so if we do not have the foundational data so we cannot produce you know uh, uh, specific geo uh, geospatial information about a particular location so also there's lack of clarity on data sharing and collaboration so uh, you know because lack of a proper policy and uh, lack of a uh, you know the extent of regulation there is no uh, clarity no information so there is no overarching legislative framework because of that uh, there is a lack of clarity on data sharing and data collaboration so that has been preventing co-creation and maximization so these are the challenges that are being associated with the geospatial technology so in this respect what should be the way forward so how we can proceed in this particular aspect so uh, establishing a geo portal and data cloud so uh, when we establish a geo portal or geo data cloud so it will make all public funded data accessible okay for example the public funded data need to be made accessible through data as a service so therefore we need to establish geo portal and data cloud secondly the bachelor's program in geospatial so that is the major challenge so uh, there, there is no dedicated university for developing the geospatial uh, skilled, skilled workforce so therefore bachelor's program in geospatial technology is very important so india should start a bachelor's program in geospatial Apart from starting the bachelor program in geospatial technology, there should be a dedicated geospatial university. So, dedicated uh, geospatial university will give a further impetus to this technology, will further generate entrepreneurship awareness among the public. So, after that, there is also a challenge with respect to regulation. So, there is no legislative framework, no policy clarity, and regulation. Uh, has resulted in a lot of confusion. So therefore, there are uh, need, there is a need for a dedicated institutions like SOI and even ISRO. So they have to be entrusted with the responsibility of regulation. Okay. So and particularly the projects related to national security and scientific significance. So regulation will ensure that there is a lack, there is a clarity on uh, how can we use. So what are the areas to be regulated? What are the areas which are under regulation? So that will help further strengthening the geospatial technology usage. So finalization of the policies is also the need of the heart. For example, the draft national geospatial policy and 
also the Indian satellite navigation policy. So in short, it is called as SAT nav policy. So these policies have to be finalized further. Okay. So uh, when we finalize these policies, they uh, provide for uh, a vision. They provide for goals, funding, and also this that this and also entrusting with the regulated responsibilities. Okay, various organizations will be entrusted with the regulated responsibilities. Okay, so therefore these policies have to be finalized. So this is how you can write a way forward about the geospatial technology. So the next question is with respect to the digital payments. Now, uh, in last 10 years, you can see the revolution transactions particularly in India. Now India has emerged as a, a global leader when it comes to the digital transactions. So in this respect uh, we need to understand uh, you know, how India emerged as a, a leading player in the uh, digital transactions surpassing major economies in the world. So, so if you look at this statistics India continues to be the top payments chart. So around 89.5 million have been using UPI, Unified Payment Interface. So you can see here, you know, 8 million India's payments are uh, more than the next four leading um, uh, economies combined. So you can imagine uh, total digital payments in India. So now even every small lender have a QR code is accepting the digital payments. So 46 percentage of the global real-time payments done alone in India. So if you compare all the real-time payments and 46 percentage of the payments have been done in India alone. Okay. So these payments are 89.5 million. So you can see here South Korea 8 million, Thailand 16.5 million, China 17 million and Brazil now, India is rightly called as a Vishwa Guru in digital payments. Why? Because you know, 46 percentage of the global real-time payments done in India. So, because of this reason, India is called as a Vishwa Guru in digital payments. So, because India has done over 25.4 billion real-time payments. Okay. Now, keeping this in mind. Transactions are more than China and US. So even though China is the most populous country and technologically advanced nation, uh, similarly US also. So India has emerged as a Vishwa Guru in digital payments. So here in the graph you can see the digital payments for the year 2020. So USA it is around 1.2 billion, China 15.7 25.4 billion. So this is a massive success for India with respect to the digital payments. So in the introduction, we'll just briefly write about India's uh, achievement with respect to digital payments. Now India today is the world's largest digitally connected democracy. So India's democracy is the world's largest digitally connected democracy. So around 800. transactions have grown, grown at a much rapid pace. So, India has around 830 million internet users. So, such a huge internet users have made the digital transaction, they have taken digital transactions to the next level. So, therefore, India now emerged as an undisputed leader in real-time digital payments. So, India now the leader of the digital payments. Now, after that, about uh, you know, how digital payments are being used. So the widespread adoption of smartphones uh, and affordable mobile data and also the government efforts to minimize the digital divide and provide the internet infrastructure has led to the India's growth in digital economy. For example, now the mobile
mobile based payments other based payments are being used uh, uh, for e commerce purchases and uh, mobile phone payments digital banking health care tourism business everywhere that is being used so that has to get to contribute to the significant growth of digital payments so what are the major modes of payment that were being used so you very often hear about unified payment interface bharat interface for money that is called as bill you pay on to pay pay you pay light cards and uh, immediate payment service that is imps and other based payment service so these are the various modes that were being used for online transactions okay for digital transactions now after that what are the tools that are being used for digital payment ecosystem so you very often hear about the aadhar jandan mobile trinity okay so aadhar jandan mobile trinity is like a foundation for the digital payments in india so uh, jandan accounts so uh, pradhan mantri jandan yojana so this is uh, a scheme that was launched by the central government for uh, enhancing the financial inclusion so bringing people who are otherwise unbanked so they do not have access to financial services bank account so as of now by 2022 over 46 crore bank accounts have been opened so far okay so around 46 crore bank accounts have been opened so far as part of the pradhan mantri jandan yojana so now out of this 46 crore bank accounts 56 percentage so they belong to women and 67 percent opened in rural and semi urban areas alone so out of 46 so we can imagine the quantum of bank accounts that were being belonged to the women so now uh, aadhar penetration is also very high now every uh, individual now have access to the aadhar so today 99 percentage of the adults have the biometric identification number with more than 1.3 billion ids issued so far by the unique identification authority of india so uh, when it comes to the mobile phone almost around 95 percentage of individuals have access to the mobile phones around 8 to 30 million have been using internet in india so all these factors have given impetus to the digital payments so apart from that the upi revolution so that has democratized the payment architecture or the payment information system okay so the unified uh, payments interface that was being launched in the year 2016 by national payments corporation of india so earlier 21 banks were part of the upi so this is a public private partnership okay this national payments corporation of india led with an interoperable platform to facilitate direct payments linked to the bank account now the welfare scheme benefits are directly transferred into the beneficiary accounts through direct benefit transfer so that has also uh, reduced leakage and also diversion of welfare scheme benefits of significance so what exactly is the significance of the uh, this particular initiative that is digital transactions so they have uh, made uh, daily life more convenient and it has also resulted in financial inclusion of the people okay so because it has expanded the banking service savings to the millions of indian people who are otherwise lack the uh, banking facilities access to the banking and financial services and it has also resulted in last mile access okay last mile access because it has extended the reach of government programs and tax collection so after that it has also encouraged entrepreneurship in india now so recently there's a, a sustained push entrepreneurship program particularly to start up india and also stand up india program so this is a sustained push to the entrepreneurship so the upi payment method has also resulted in or digital transactions has also resulted in increased entrepreneurship among the youth so the digital infrastructure is seen as a set of rail track or it has seen as a foundation based on which 
okay so that will further encourage the entrepreneurship so it has also resulted in a significant behavioral shift to cash driven economy now lately the indian economy is categorized as a cash driven economy now the cash driven economy to a less cash economy less cash economy so india has made a rapid transformation to a less cash economy so after that now upi uh, is being a digital transaction so not just limited to india but they have also expanded it to other other countries for example indian digital payment systems are available in countries like singapore uae oman saudi arabia malaysia france and the benelux markets so what are those benelux markets to countries like belgium netherlands and luxembourg switzerland so to these countries also India has also signed an MOU with thirteen countries so that want to adopt UPI interface for digital payments. So because of all these factors, UPI has resulted in a, a major, uh, uh, you know, a major aspect in digital transaction. 